Greetings, and welcome back for another Music Theory Byte. In this video, I'm going to show you how to write and resolve cadential 6-4 chords. If that sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, then this is the video for you. What is a cadential 6-4 chord? Well, let's break down the two parts of the name. Cadential refers to the musical term cadence. A cadence is a point of pausing in the music. Cadences typically happen at the end of a phrase, or the end of a section, or the end of a piece of music. They tell us that that section that we're listening to, or phrase, is coming to an end. And so we listen for that, and it creates a sense of musical pausing. And we can create cadences using rhythm, using harmony, using melody, lots of different ways, as long as we're creating a sense of pausing in the musical fabric, or even stopping at the end of the piece, we would typically call that a cadence. 6-4 refers to the figured bass symbols that go with a triad in second inversion. You'll remember from my video on spelling triads that one of the characteristics of a triad is inversion. When the fifth of the chord is in the bass, we call it second inversion. If we were to spell the triad in its closest position, we'll see that we have a sixth above the bass and a fourth above the bass. And so therefore, a second inversion triad gets the figured bass symbol 6-4. Like all 6-4 chords, cadential 6-4s have to be handled in very specific and formulaic ways. So let's talk about that. A typical 6-4 chord is made up of the pitches of the tonic triad. So we're going to see scale degree 1, scale degree 3, and scale degree 5. And of course that scale degree 5, in order to put it in second inversion, needs to be in the bass. If you're dealing with four voices, as with all 6-4 chords, we double the bass pitch, or the fifth of the chord. Cadential 6-4 chords are extensions of a dominant sound. So when we hear them, we're expecting a dominant chord, eventually, that we will resolve to. I'll show you how that works in just a minute. Let's first take a cadential 6-4 and resolve it the correct way. So here we see a cadential 6-4 chord written in the key of B-flat major. You'll notice I have the notes of the tonic triad, a B flat, a D, and two Fs, because in four voices I always want to double the bass of a 6-4 chord. Now when I resolve these things, the way that I will typically do them is first I'll find the bass pitch. And the bass pitch will either stay on the same pitch, or more characteristically, it will drop an octave. So we're moving from the 1 6 4, to the 5 that it typically resolves to. Next, I find the root of the chord and the third of the chord, and both of those pitches will resolve down by step. The remaining scale degree, scale degree 5, the note that we doubled on the 1 6 4 chord, either stays on scale degree 5 if we're resolving just to a dominant triad, or it will step down if the resolution is to a dominant 7th chord. And so it sounds like this. And then, of course, it will resolve out. Now, if you're paying really close attention, you might notice that I have some potential part writing errors in my example here. The first is parallel fifths. If you take a look at the B flat in the tenor, and the F and the alto, they both step down to the dominant seventh chord. So the B flat steps down to the leading tone, which is A, and the F steps down to the chord fourth scale degree, or the chord seventh, which is an E flat. So I have a fifth moving to a fifth. This is one of those exceptions to the rule about parallel fifths. In general, it is okay to move from perfect fifths, F to B flat, to diminished fifth, A to E flat, because the change of quality of those fifths makes it not sound like parallel perfect fifths. It's important to note that I could not do the opposite. I can't go from a diminished fifth back to a perfect fifth. For some reason, that sounds like parallel fifths. The other thing you might notice is if I were to revoice this chord, I still have a second inversion chord, tonic 6-4 chord or cadential 6-4 chord, 
but now you'll see that I have my base doubled on the F in the base staff. So when the whole thing resolves out, like this, and then of course that will resolve out to a final tonic, you'll notice that my tenor goes below where the bass was in the previous chord when it steps down. Typically, this would be an unwanted voice crossing, but in this context, it happens so frequently in real music that this is another exception to the rule. If you double your bass pitch on the cadential 6-4 and the bass drops by an octave, the tenor is permitted to step down to become the chord 7th of the dominant 7th. And as always, we resolve any dominant 7th as we normally would. If you need help with that, you can check out my video on spelling and resolving dominant sevenths. One other very important characteristic of these chords. Cadential 6-4 chords have a metric component. That is, they show up on the strong beat of a measure. So typically, we would have a dominant that starts at the beginning of a measure. And as I said, these were dominant extensions before. What we'll do is we'll delay the arrival on the dominant by using a cadential 6-4. But that cadential 6-4 has to begin on a strong beat of the measure. So I can use a cadential 6-4 wherever I normally have a dominant chord and I simply want to embellish it or prolong it in some way. So for example, I have a phrase here, just a very simple phrase, just chords basically written out, and it sounds like this without any cadential 6-4 chords put in. So the cadence, of course, of this phrase occurs at the end, on the dominant chord leading to the tonic chord. We would call that an authentic cadence, a dominant, a 5 in this case, going to a 1. Now if I wanted to embellish that just a little bit, I can use my cadential 6-4 chord. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delay the arrival on the dominant by using the notes of a tonic chord over the dominant scale degree and have those notes fall over into the dominant sound. So it sounds like this. This is the same phrase with the cadential 6-4 added in on the final cadence. Notice how it starts on a strong metric position, the downbeat of the second last measure. I do have a second opportunity for a cadential 6-4 chord in this example. Notice the third chord is also a dominant. Now cadential 6-4 sets up the expectation of a cadence. Not all cadences are fulfilled. Not all expectations of cadences are fulfilled, especially in the instance of a deceptive resolution, a 5 chord, a dominant chord, moving to a 6 chord. So this is another opportunity. I can take that dominant chord in the third measure, create the expectation of a cadence, and then have the deceptive resolution move me towards a phrase extension. It's still a cadential 6-4 chord. I have a 5 chord moving to what we expect to be a 1 chord. In this case, it turns out to be a 6 chord instead. But I put my cadential 6-4 on the downbeat of that third measure to create the expectation that it's going to be some sort of authentic cadence, a 5 to 1. And it sounds like this. So cadential 6-4 chords seem pretty straightforward at least in how you write them and how you resolve them. How you label them, however, is not nearly so straightforward. In fact, this is an instance of one of those discussions or arguments going on in music theory today. 
So far you've noticed that I've labeled my cadential 6-4 chords in two ways. First, I have it as a 1-6-4. That is, it's the notes of a tonic triad put in second inversion, which then resolve to the dominant chord, the 5 chord. Many people feel that since these chords are really extensions of the dominant, that is, as soon as we hear that dominant scale degree in the bass, we really are on a dominant chord, and the other two tones are simply non-chord tones that fall over into the real chord tone. So as a result, they will label these as five with the figured bass symbols showing those suspension or non-chord tone figures, either 6-4 falling over to 5-3, or in the case of a dominant seventh, 8-6-4 falling over to 7-5-3. People who label it that way believe that the chord is fundamentally a dominant. It has a dominant sound to it. And in fact, you could take away the cadential 6-4, like my original example of the phrase, and it doesn't essentially change the phrase at all. Other people say not so fast. The chord tones are members of a tonic chord, and there is a certain tonicness about the chord. If I were to rewrite that, and instead of putting scale degree 5 in the bass, put scale degree 1 in the bass, it would still work and sound more or less the same. Here's what it sounds like. As a result, another way of labeling these things is putting the 164 followed by the 57, but putting the entire thing over a bracket with the Roman numeral 5 underneath. That shows that there is a tonic chord, or a chord with the tonic scale degrees, that resolves to a dominant, but the entire thing has really a dominant sound to it. So which one should you use? Well, if you're, well, if you're in a music theory class, you should definitely use the one that your theory teacher tells you to use. If you're not in a music theory class and you're learning this on your own, you should use the one that makes the most sense to you. Personally, Sometimes, I think the cadential 6-4 chord is acting as an extension to the dominant, but there are other times that I feel that it is just a change of position of a tonic chord. And so for me, it really depends on how I'm hearing that particular passage in that piece on that particular day. There really isn't necessarily a wrong answer to it, it's how you hear it, which is one of the most important concepts that goes into musical harmonic analysis. Well, that does it for this video. If you found it helpful, please like. Make sure to leave constructive comments below. And as always, make sure you subscribe to my channel for the latest Music Theory Bites as they become available. Until next time.